Good morning if you are in the West Coast and good afternoon if you are in the East Coast. Um, welcome to the uh, our What's Up in Ottoman Turkish Studies uh, series in December. Uh, today, let me share my screen with you so you can see uh, my introductions uh, very briefly. Uh, we will discuss uh, my colleague Carter Finley's book, Enlightening Europe on Islam and the Ottomans, uh, Muraja Dawson and his masterpiece. Uh, so our speaker today is Carter Finley, <laughs> who is uh, very well known to uh, most of you. Uh, if you are a sort of a great uh, Ottoman and Turkish studies person. And for those of you who are joining uh, WhatsApp for the first time, my name is Baki Tezjan. I teach history at the University of California in Davis, and I convene the WhatsApp and Ottoman Turkish Ottoman uh, panel series. Uh, Carter Finley has been actually in the past a president of the uh, what was then called the Turkish Studies Association that later became the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association. He's had a very long career at the university, uh, Ohio State University, um, where I had a chance to meet him actually when I was uh, doing a summer course learning uh, second level intermediate Persian there. Uh, he has many books, more books than most of us, and he must have a secret, for his productivity, maybe he'll tell us. Uh, so his first book was Bureaucratic Reform in the Ottoman Empire, The Sublime Court, 1789-1922, then Ottoman Civil Officialdom, then The Turks in World History, uh, uh, more recently, Turkey, Islam, Nationalism, and Modernity, before uh, he published the book that we are about to talk today. Um, and after Carter's presentation, we'll have uh, two commentators today, uh, one of them is my colleague from UCLA, Sebu Aslanian. Uh, he is a professor of history and Richard Hovanisian endowed chair in modern Armenian history there. And he is also the inaugural uh, chair, uh, uh, inaugural director of the Center for Armenian Studies at UCLA. Uh, his award-winning book from the Indian Ocean to the Mediterranean is right here on the uh, screen. And uh, his Upcoming work uh, is going to be released from Yale University about mobility of Armenian writers and printers. Uh, and then next we have Claudia Roma, uh, who joins will join us from Vienna. Uh, she taught at the University of Vienna for uh, about 30 years uh, and just retired earlier this October. Um, he has also many books. His complete list of publications goes over 100 articles, but three of the books are right here on the screen. Uh, and you can see them. Um, oh, Arthur, if you could, if you could read yourself, that'd be great. Uh, Arthur's phone is ringing. Sorry about that. Uh, Claudia Rumer also has an interest in Ottoman grammar and syntax, which is less known. Actually, that's how she entered uh, historical documents. Uh, she is an expert on Ottoman diplomatics. Uh, we will first start, go ahead with Carter's first, then Claudia will take over, and then last will go Cebu. Carter, I'm going to stop sharing now. Please go ahead. Okay. Share screen, okay. Uh, a share screen. Well, oh, share. I'm sorry, I'm there's one more button that I've realized. Carter, you got it. It, it is now, now you're sharing your screen. Where, what has happened to my PowerPoint presentation? You know, the, tr the trouble is, um, I think I shut myself out of PowerPoint to try to do one of the things you wanted me to do. Oh, dear Jesus. 
Okay. Um, the I can't figure out why I can't bring it up. You. Carter, you, you see your screen, we see your screen, which one uh, is, is your presentation on? Do you remember? You know, you asked me to do something and I think it shut it down. I've been trying to tell you, I think, and, and, and, and now I, let me see, open. Bring your presentation to open. Okay. Um, okay. C can you see it now? Uh, uh, this right now, what we see is your screen with a lot of documents, uh, thumbnails. Oh, wait a sec. From beginning. Not the. Pre oh, there we go. We see it now. Uh, we see it now. Okay. Well, uh, I just want to do enough to, to introduce the topic and explain where it came from and how I got interested in it. Let me see if I can bring bring up the uh, the um, the pointer. Yeah, the laser pointer might help. Okay, I should have called my book enlightening Europe on Islam and the Ottomans, Muraja Dosan on law and the state, because that's what he really wrote about. The book was designed, it's not a travel book, it's not an Orientalist book. It was designed as a practical manual to, to provide European rulers, kings and statesmen with everything they needed to know to get along with the Padishah of Islam. He was doing this on behalf of the Swedes, and there was a particular reason why the Swedes wanted this more than anybody else. Uh, and here you see a portrait of him as a Swedish civil official in the official dress, Svenska Drakten, designed by uh, King Gustav III, and with his Vasa order on the green ribbon around his neck. Okay, come on, arrow. Okay, the origins of the project go back to this uh, episode unique in the history of the Ottoman Empire when a reigning European sovereign resided in the Ottoman Empire long enough to acquire a nickname by which he was and still is known in Ottoman. Charles XII, Demir Vash, state property or permanent fixture. And that was because of his uh, five year stay at Bandar after losing the Battle of Poltava uh, with a very large entourage of uh, mostly Swedish elites who became curious about everything to do with the Ottomans, most particularly including the practicalities of managing relations with them in the interest of protecting Sweden from Russia. What enabled Moraja, uh, for, you know, for decades, other people, uh, Swedes were trying to produce something like this, but they, they didn't have what it needed. Moraja, who was their uh, Secretary of Embassy and interpreter in Istanbul from 1764 to 84, had both intellectual capital and financial capital to do the job. He, had, he commanded Arabic and Turkish, and he had tutors from the ulema. So he really has deep knowledge of, of these subjects. He understood the Linnaean taxonomic methodology, which is what the Swedes wanted. And he also had access through his father-in-law to the chief harem eunuch and the palace artists. In addition, he had financial capital, at least until he did this book, partly because of his marriage to uh, uh, the daughter of Abraham Kulelian, and the father-in-law was the, the uh, chief, the uh, chief harem eunuch's financier, or Sara. In addition, Moraja made money on his own through business ventures, both for himself and for the Swedish envoys of the period, uh, Gustav and Ulrich Selsing, who between them ran the Swedish mission in Istanbul for 30 years. 
And uh, uh, this combination is what enabled him to come up with really fabulous illustrations, including this iftar with the Grand Vizier, which is an early sign of the artistic collaboration between uh, Constantin Capodalla in, in Istanbul and Charles Nicolas Cochin, who was the king of engraving when Dosso got there in 1784. As for how I got into doing this, uh, I was when I was doing the dissertation research for my first book about bureaucratic reform, I discovered uh, a, a volume by this this guy uh, who, who identified himself on the title page only as Monsieur the M dot dot dot Dosson. Well, if he's the author, why doesn't he want us to know what his name is? And also, the book was called Le Tableau Général de l'Empire Ottoman in two parts, of which one has legislation and the other has history. Well, that was the volume I needed. It was, he, he knew more about the Ottoman bureaucracy than, than anybody else for that period, but it was not a history in any sense that I could recognize. Was I making a fool of myself to rely on a book that uh, had a misleading name by an author who didn't want us to know what he was? Well, what gave me confidence to persist was I saw Uzun Charshala in his writings. Whenever he wrote about the 18th century, he would rely on Dosso as if it was another Ottoman manuscript like the others he used. So he obviously thought Dosso was authoritative. And so this stuck in my mind. I became lastingly curious. Other confusing factors had to do with the fact that the book was described as having both seven volumes and three volumes. But the only ones I could ever find were the seven volume sets or parts of it. There were also <coughs> allusions to illustrations, but the volumes I found had no illustrations. So if there were illustrations, where were they? This is the kind of thing, this is enough to make you curious. Well, when I got time to study it, I discovered there was indeed a big uh, problem about the relationship between the title and the contents. It is a taxonomy, taxonomy of, about law and government. In terms of how it's actually laid out, five-sixths of it are law and related subjects, and one-sixth are the government. He refers to the law as a code, but then he said it, is, it has codes inside of it. So he's really talking about a code divided into subcodes. And of course, he's the one who organized the material in that form. When he get, <coughs> gets into his religion code, it turns out that it covers the very same topics that Turks know as Ilmihal. So it is the basics of Islam. He starts off with the basics of Islam as developed in an Ilmihal manual. And as far as where his history goes, uh, uh, eventually when I read uh, one of the works of Foucault, I discovered that at this period, the concepts of history and natural history had not yet differentiated. And so calling something a history, when it is more like a tax, a, a layout of, you know, mineralogical specimens or something like that, is, is conformable to the state of knowledge production in the period. And in terms of the actual contents in the book, as we find it, there's his main text, plus his 233 engravings, plus other vignettes, passages. He, he identifies most often his observations, and he will take a ride on some subject. And those are the, those have the most human interest. Uh, in fact, they, they make you lose track of, of whether the book even has an overall plan. Those are so interesting that I selected a lot of them and translated them as box texts with his uh, his signature reproduced over them and headed Muraja Speaks, the sociological and historical digressions. And actually, they are one of the most interesting things about it. So there are tableaus within the tableau, both verbal and pictorial. One of the things I would most like to do now is make people more aware of these Muraja Speaks passages. Uh, uh, I've uh, contacted uh, Brill about whether they were 
uh, might create something like a website. The the kind of, uh, the kind of thing that uh, uh, the, the the kind of interest that a lot of Ottomans have in the letters of Lady Mary Wortley Montague, she has five vivid scenes in her letters. Those songs has five times five times five, and uh, it's they really ought to be better known, and they would be very useful in a lot of classroom settings. Okay, he also, of course, had personal goals in writing this. And, and here is one of the illustrations produced for his work showing the dinner of, of, of a European minister with a grand vizier as part of the uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, envoy's presentation at the palace. And of course, Dossau had officiated in a number of these as the interpreter, and his career goal was to end up as the envoy, which he did precariously. Once those song got to Paris, it took something to get people there interested in wanting to help him publish his book. And in fact, he had the makings of doing that. It got caught up in uh, a sort of literary uh, uh, and political duel with uh, Choiseul Gouffier, who was an early bird of both Philhellenism and Russophilia. In 1782, he had published a, a work called The Voyage Pittoresque de la Grèce, with a frontispiece depicting La Grèce here as a woman in chains awaiting her deliverance. Well, okay. Uh, at Versailles, Louis XVI's marriage to the Austrian princess Marie Antoinette had created a, a pro-Austrian faction at Versailles. In terms of the <coughs> history of French alliances, that was, that was uh, a historical. The traditional French alliance, they, for, traditionally the French had been enemies of Austria and allies with the Ottomans. So people at Versailles who weren't happy with this new Austrian faction gravitated to the king's next younger brother, the man who would later be uh, king as Louis XVIII after 1815. And uh, in the titular tour of the period, he was known as Monsieur. Uh, it's a unique term for the king's next younger brother. And he happened to patronize a printing house run by the Didot family who were uh, in the vanguard of uh, typo typography and, and the modernization of printing. And so uh, Dossal book got published at the Imprimerie de Monsieur, this Didot printing house, and dedicated not to uh, the future Louis XVI himself, but to Gustav III of Sweden, who was Dossal's boss. Inside, you have a text on law and government that is designed to prove that the Ottomans here was not a despotism. So La, La Glace was not in slavery. And uh, take that, Choiseul, and take that, uh, Catherine the Great. <laughs> Illustrating the tableau was a big, big job. And this is what happened to Dossal's fortune. The printing, we think, must have been paid for by the prince who patronized the printing house because there's no sign of Dossal ever having spats about money uh, with his printers. And he had spats about money with everybody else. To illustrate it required three generations of pictures First, Istanbul's had to be originals had to be produced in Istanbul, all of which have been lost, except there's a direct carry forward between some of them and, and engravings that actually appear in the book. Then uh, in Paris, uh, Paris uh, artists had to redraw a lot of them to clarify them for the engravers. And then the book ended up with 20, 233 published engravings, of which 44 are scenes that mostly fill uh, an entire folio or, or sometimes a uh, two double page folio with, with fold outs. Of course, this is the point of the three volume edition in folio size volumes because it needed those big pages to show the engravings. And then there are all the other engravings, the rest of the engravings are single figures, which are usually displayed four to a page. 
As to who worked on it in Istanbul, we know that Konstantin Kapadala and his workshop led. Uh, Gunsel Renda's research uh, enabled me to figure that out. How many others there were, we don't know. In Paris, uh, artists' names were put on the engravings. It, it doesn't mean they signed them. It means that, that a letter engraver was giving a list of names to put on the engravings. So it's not like signatures on an oil painting. At any rate, there are 58 Paris artists in, who worked on this in all. So it was, it was a small army of people that it took to produce this work. Seven of them did original drawing, including some very famous people. All the others either engraved or etched. One of Dossal's points that I couldn't understand for a long time was he insisted all his engravings were necessary. Okay, well, it turns out when you look at the Choiseau book, you see what he meant because it was still was produced in the style of, of the Baroque era that had a lot of extra decorative fall to all in it, four or five different types of images, some of which didn't particularly relate to the text. Those songs engravings all relate directly to his text. In many cases, they are sources for the uh, descriptions he wrote about them, which I, of which I translated a lot in those Moraja Speaks passages. So here is uh, one of the scenes that actually did not make it into the engravings. It's one of the originals produced in Paris for the engravers to work from. It's a scene depicting the celebration of a birth in the imperial harem. And it's accurate right down to the uh, Dossal's description of the colors, the red and the blue in the room. And in terms of its architectural exactitude, well, Constantin Capadalu actually decorated rooms like this. He could send drawings to Paris, which were exact. And then the leading Paris artist who are, produced a lot of these architectural scenes was a man named uh, Louis Nicolas de Lespinas. And he had been trained as a topographical drawing draftsman used by the French army. And so he could he could uh, uh, reduce, uh, reproduce uh, scenes in Istanbul that he had never seen with breathtaking accuracy. Okay, at this point, I'd like to uh, uh, stop it so others can speak and, and, and uh, uh, turn it over now to uh, uh, Sebu and Claudia, and then we can have questions from the audience. I have other engravings, uh, uh, uh, uh, and if they become relevant to subjects that come up later, uh, then I'll do that. I can show you those. Okay. Baki, do I hit stop share now? Carter, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, you could stop sharing. And Claudia, please, you go ahead. Uh, uh, Sebul and I are uh, on the phone trying to solve a technical issue we are facing. If not, he's going to join us through the phone after Claudia. Okay, Claudia, go ahead. Thank you, Baki. And thank you, Carter, for the presentation. Um, when reading the book, I um, observed several interesting things, which I want to share with you now. Uh, first of all, um, it seems to me like a leitmotif that you always talk about the triangle uh, between Sweden, France, and the Ottoman Empire, uh, which, of course, has its basic reason, the first reason that uh, Muraja was um, had a French mother and um, an Armenian Ottoman father, and he served, like his father, um, um, at the embassy of the Swedes. So uh, this triangle uh, always comes again throughout your book, and I think this, this was a very good idea, and uh, it helps a lot. Uh, understanding the, the, the background and um, also many of the things that, that occurred. And I especially liked the, the comparison or between uh, these three states uh, at the time of Muraja lived. So um, I think uh, I like this very much. And also you, you, you give many historical and political and legal um, uh, circumstances and the history of, of um, these circumstances in these three uh, states. And sometimes other nations are added, like Russia or Austria. 
And at the very end, you come back again to this triangle, but then you expand it uh, to all the other nations where Muradja was uh, um, taken up and where his work was read and translated and commented upon and so on. So I think this triangle idea really uh, is like a leitmotif. Then uh, what, what struck me was uh, Muraja's network. It starts, of course, with his family, his father bringing those 42 um, uh, pictures uh, to him, to Paris. Uh, and then, of course, his son, who, who finished uh, printing his work. And then other people, like uh, Ebu Bekir Ratib Efendi, whom oh, he made yes. in Vienna, together with uh, Hammer, of course, uh, when Hammer uh, uh, made his speech to Ebu Bekir Ratib Efendi. And then he met a number of important uh, people like Mehmet Rashid um, and others. And also what struck me was uh, when you talked about the um, similarity of some of his engraving with uh, some of the Dietz um, uh, pictures. So this was a very interesting aspect. And not to forget, of course, uh, the Swedish king, uh, Gustav III, who especially uh, commissioned this tree painting of the Ottoman uh, gene genealogy. And of course, there are also networks of enemies, if one may call it like this, um, especially Baron Herbert of Rathkai, <laughs> and of course, the French ambassador, Ruffin. So, and also, all this uh, comes together within the, the network of political uh, amities and enmities among the Europeans living in Istanbul. So uh, this, this really gives a very vivid picture of um, the background on which um, Muraja worked while in Istanbul. Uh, and then also the, the, the way and the, the historical um, um, background of the French Revolution, which um, took place actually uh, in his time, and also partly he had to he had to leave Paris uh, uh, right before things got bad, uh, may have gone bad for him. Um, what a very interesting chapter is the one on engravings, I think, because uh, just as you mentioned now, um, you had these three generations of um, making an engraving. And uh, I think I learned a lot about printing uh, in European, uh, and especially in France, in European countries and in France. And uh, so this is really something that uh, you don't read about so often, I think. In, in our field, I mean. Um, Muraja's idea, as you said, was to explain the Ottomans or explain Islam and the Ottomans to Europeans. And so he, he was uh, a kind of a mediator between cultures. Uh, you say this quite some times in, in your book. And the interesting thing is that he presents uh, Islam on the basis of um, the, the very well-known work, Murtaka, um, and he doesn't use any European sources. Um, and his history also is, uh, especially for the first um, years of the Ottoman Empire, um, not based on European sources, but on Ottoman sources, although he only starts um, with a very with a 16th century text, I think you said you said. Mm. Um, and where he couldn't get direct um, information, he relied on reports uh, of others, 
um, especially where he couldn't go himself, where he had no access, like the, the bath for women, the women's bath or the harem and so on. Uh, as you said today as well, he, he makes a lot of digressions and he writes in a, as you say, in the, in the, the noble style of French, so still noble. Uh, and you, you have two pairs, I think, of, of chapters that are, f first of all, uh, explain uh, the text uh, he presents. And on the other hand, the, the second chapters uh, present the, the engravings. And these illustrations, uh, some of these are based on miniatures and some others are, are not. And especially the depiction of, of Burak. Um, oh, yes. Is mm -hmm. uh, an Islamic, has an Islamic background. He, he wouldn't have been able to find that in any other uh, European work at the time. Uh, with with a number of engravings, some questions have, have arisen uh, with me. Um, I looked at some of the books that are depicted. And in, in some engravings, I think the books look more like European books, like European medieval books with clasps on the sides. And his own library, however, you have this wonderful engraving where he put together um, the way Ottoman books look like. And uh, you, you say that it's his own books that were just heaped up uh, to, to make this uh, picture. And here you can even read the, the, the titles of the books. And, and you can also uh, see that these books are Oriental books, because they have the, the typical Oriental book cover. Mm -hmm. um, this, this just uh, aroused my interest because once I was, uh, I took part in a conference on paper and uh, restoration and book bindings. And there was uh, a British, um, a British uh, res restorator who was an expert on, on book covers in pictures, in medieval and Renaissance pictures. And so from that moment onward, I always look at the, at the books that occur in, in pictures. So this is interesting, really. And another thing I, I remarked was that in one picture, there was a person wearing glasses. Um, I think that that's quite unique. <laughs> and an, a, th a third question that, that I, I found out was that he has this table of um, character Arab, of the Arabic alphabet mm -hmm. and all the different kinds of, of the Arabic script, which he imitated quite well, I think, except perhaps for the Kufi, which looks a bit clumsy to my mind. Uh, and then I, I went on looking at inscriptions, and there is this uh, engraving of Ayyub, and it seems to me that the writing of the, the tables that were uh, put up in Ayyub uh, are more like fantasy, whereas in Hagia Sophia they are, they are quite legible. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder if uh, this was the engravers doing or uh, the, the, I don't know. So this is, I think, interesting because he himself knew, of course, the Arabic script. He, he could write and read since he worked as a translator. Um, another thing that uh, I think is interesting is that um, Hammer discusses Muraja's work 
in his Staatsverwaltung, as you write. Mm -hmm. And but but he doesn't he gives the, the contents, but then he doesn't go on relying on it or on on uh, Multaka, but he uses Kanu Names. And Hammer, uh, as you said, his the Muraja's work is taxonomic, really. And of course, taxonomy, you, you also mentioned Linné, uh, who did the great um, plant taxonomy. Um, so Hammer calls his taxonomic work um, a statistical work. Uh, of course, it is statistical in a way, but not in, in the, the narrow way we understand today, as you say, but uh, you say it's um, as he gives um, taxonomical information on a number of um, things like um, official bureaucrats and the, the various ranks they have and so on. And then, and this is the point with which I, I want to end my, my comments. Um, at the very end of the book, uh, you again um, talk first of all about the, this triangle, but then you say that um, the, the message uh, Muraja wants to, um, to communicate is first that Islam is a rational religion and the Ottoman Empire is a monarchy ruled by law and not uh, a despotism without any rules. And then he, he gives some advice for the Ottomans, uh, so to speak. Um, the, the Ottoman Empire would need enlightened reform to overcome defects. And it would need an enlightened sultan. And the sultan needs new elites. And the new elites need uh, improved conditions of service. And this would all result in an openness to the outside world. Uh, and this will enhance the reform uh, procedure. So uh, to my mind, this nearly sounds like a, like a new circle of justice, doesn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Anika. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, we are having a, a little technical difficulties uh, between um, uh, Sabu and uh, my IT, I, I, I, I made a mistake. I don't usually make such mistakes, but I made a mistake. But Cebu is so kind and gentle that uh, he agreed to um, read his comments on uh, WhatsApp through this phone connection. So he will read to you his comments uh, through the phone, and uh, I hope uh, everybody will be hearing. Sebu, welcome, and I am again so, so sorry. I apologize profusely. Let's uh, start. Go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, Bucky, and please do not worry. These things happen to the best of us, and um, technology is uh, a double-edged sword, and this is a case in point. So I'd like to first begin by thanking Bucky for the kind invitation and Finley for uh, Carter Finley for this wonderful book that he has written, as well as my fellow uh, discussant for joining us today. My talk today uh, is called The Man from Ararat, question mark. Notes on Ignatius Muraja Dawson as an intersectional Ramian go between. So Ignatius Dawson's Tableau General de l'Empire Ottoman is a monument to erudition and a work with which Ottomanists today are more or less familiar. Until recently, Many aspects of its celebrated but hardly understood author's life remained obscure, however. Carter Findlay's superbly researched, timely, and illuminating study enlightening Europe on Islam and the Ottomans rescues this important go-between from historical oblivion. This micro-historical work sets out to explore, quote, the relation between the author's work and his life 
and argues that a textual study of the tableau, quote, cannot be isolated from the author's life and circumstances, unquote. Beyond a close philological reading and explication of Dosson's lavishly illustrated magnum opus, not to mention his learned comments on print culture in Paris, Findlay adroitly uses Muraja's life and work to paint his own tableau of the inner connections between Sweden, the Austrian regime, France, and the Ottoman Empire during the 18th century. He thus places under a microscope relatively smaller objects, Muraja's biography and authorship to tell a larger story about European states and how <laughs> the cultures with which it came into contact. Referring to Muranja's life and identity, Finley contends that classifying him as a European outsider and, uh, and Orientalist, as some Ottoman scholars have done, is highly inaccurate, if not false, as is the claim in the opposite direction, that Armenianness was somehow central to Muranja's knowledge production. As he puts it, quote, it also misleads to overstate Muraja's Armenian identity, which did not loom large in his literary self-presentation, unquote. When asked by my colleague Bucky to, uh, to serve as a commentator for today's event, one of the commentators, I was honored but also reluctant, since I'm not a trained Ottomanist nor a specialist in Ottoman Armenian history. Rather, I am an early modern global historian specializing in Armenian history and documentation who has studied confessionalism, print culture, and the rise of Armenian Catholicism in the early modern era, topics that are germane to an understanding of Muranja's life and work. Moreover, I have dealt with mobile individuals uh, with intersectional and multiple identities like Muranja himself. Bucky eventually persuaded me to join this panel when he asked me to frame my discussion on the question of whether Muranja's subject position as an Armenian Catholic might have played any meaningful role in his successes as a diplomat and historian. I therefore agreed uh, to participate and offer today to you some modest and provisional and a provisional menagerie of thoughts regarding Muranja's own intersectionality and his in-between and go-between status and its possible influence on the channels of information and knowledge accessible or desirable to him. Regarding Muranja's Armenianness or lack thereof, I agree with Finley wholeheartedly that we should not overstate its importance. Certainly, Muranja appears to have hardly mentioned his Armenian filiations in the extant literary remains of his life. In the tableau's more than thousand folios, for instance, Armeni is mentioned fleetingly only twice. When the author first introduces himself to his reader in his discours preliminaire, he does so not as an Armenian or even Catholic, but as a kind of rooted cosmopolitan. To, quote, pierce through the clouds, unquote, of Ottoman history, and that cover the springs that set into motion the, its immense, the immense machinery of Ottoman statecraft. One must be like a native, Muraja tells us. One must have lived there, mastered the languages spoken by the empire's diverse peoples and be free as much as possible from the prejudices of religion and distance that lead to orientalist misreadings of ottoman culture religion and history with this in place the author first presents himself in the tableau like a native but with more connections he describes himself as i quote from the french here né à constantinople élevé dans le pays même et attaché toute ma, toute ma vie au service d'une cour liée avec la porte par des relations intimes. Unquote. Reading Finley, as well as the tableau, 
it becomes conspicuously clear that Armenianness was not in Muraja's known repertoire of self-presentation, to use Goffman's terminology. This, along with Muraja's role of being a go-between or a diplomatic and cultural intermediary, representing and defending the merits of Ottoman history from Orientalism, might also explain why Armenian scholars or writers have been impervious to his very existence in history. I spent considerable time looking for mentions of him in Armenian sources, but alas, to no avail. To no avail. Mm. The main reference to him and his Armenian connections appears to be the work of the Ottoman Armenian writer, uh, Harutyun Marmarian, whose small monograph is cited by in Kemal Beydili's pioneering essay in Tarih Dergisi. Uh, my first impression of Muraja, therefore, was that surely there was a significant corpus of scholarship on him in Armenian that neither Beydili nor Findlay had come across due to language barriers. I looked in vain. The man's Armenian afterlife is an enigma and the spectral presence at best. The only exception is a now neglected and laconic biographical entry by the Mahitar's father, Mateos Marak Theopilians, in his Kensa Krutun Yereveli Arans, or Biography of Eminent Men, published in 1839 in two volumes. Moreover, the entry is silent or reticent to discuss Muranja's Catholicity, uh, a topic that is quite uh, central to his identity. We know he was half French on his mother's side and Catholic and Armenian on his father's lineage. When did the family convert to Catholicism in Para, if they converted during the age of confessionalism? Uh, uh, or whether uh, if they converted to the age of confessionalism is not broached by Theo Pirianz's uh, entry, nor by any other known author, any other author known to me. The Muranjans might have been Catholics of long standing in the capital's 8,000 strong Catholic Armenian community at the beginning of the 18th century. More likely, it is possible that they converted during the late 17th century when missionaries from Rome and Paris first began to make inroads into the Armenian community of the empire. My suspicion or hunch is that the Tosunian uh, family were adherents of the Mahitarist order of San Lazaro in the Venetian Lagoon, founded in the Ottoman capital in 1701 and relocated to the Lagoon in Venice in 1770. A selection of documents from the Mahitarist archives covering the period from 1707 to 1773 were fortunately published in 1930 and contain sparse references to various Muraja family members as belonging to this order. A certain father Anton Vartabet Murajan is noted in connection to a fire in Istanbul near the Muraja home in September of 1962. Another letter from the same period discussing the fire mentions that it occurred at the house of, quote, our own father Joseph of the Muradja family, unquote. A list of Mahitara's fathers during the 19th century notes that Father Joseph Muradjan was indeed a Mahitara's monk, born in Istanbul in 1714, uh, um, ordained as a priest in 1739, and passed away in San Lanzaro in 1772. The question naturally arises if this Joseph might possibly be a relative of Ignatius, perhaps an uncle. It certainly is possible and would not come as a surprise given that another celebrated Armenian Catholic in Istanbul, who like Muranja was a creature of the Ottoman literati, was also an intersectional Armenian who was educated by Mkhitaryan priests and felt comfortable wearing many hats. I am referring, of course, to Hofsep Vartanyan or Vartan Pasha, who is now seen as being the author of the first Ottoman novel, Akabi Hikayisi, published in 1851 in Armeno-Turkish or Hayadar Turkeren, 
which is essentially Anatolian vernacular Turkish written in the Armenian script. It would be curious to learn if some of Muradja's personal papers at the Lund University Library mention the Mahitars in San Lazaro, or more curious even, if the correspondence of Vartabit's fathers Anton and Hofsep in the archives of San Lazaro mention our author. Bedili, relying on Mermerian's Hin Oneri Mezatum Mer, 1550 to 1870, or the olden days and the Armenian notables of those days, published in San Lazaro in 1901, states that our polymath Ignatius visited the island of San Lazaro in 1792 and possibly did some philological work there in the company of the island's two leading scholar priests, Father Mikhail Chamchian and Hugas Injijian, both fellow Istanbul Yots of Catholic Armenian confession and celebrated savans of their age. Chamchian, 1738 to 1822, was notable for his vast erudition and authoring, and for authoring the first modern history of the Armenians, of the Armenians, though how modern it was and in what fashion remains to be fully explored. His three volumes, his three volume History of the Armenians was published in Venice at the same time as the tableau was being set to type in Paris and remained highly readable and unsurpassed until the late 19th century. The other intellectual, Inji Jian, 1758 to 1833, was the first Armenian to publish works on modern geography, beginning with a short geographical treatise of 1791 and culminating in the collaborative 12 volume, his geography of the four parts of the world from 1804 to the uh, 1820s, of which, Inji Jian himself authored the two volumes devoted to the Ottoman Empire, consisting of a total of 700 pages with which illustrations these volumes are no doubt as taxonomic and erudite as Moranja's tableau. And, and there might even be some reciprocal influence here between our authors. Only a further examination of surviving documentation can tell us how dense Muranja's webs, web of connections with San Lazaro were and whether there was in fact collaboration between him and the other and the monks on the island. To some, or in some, while Armenians may not have been a subject position that Muranja Doson himself seems to have chosen as a public identity marker from his repertoire of identification, identifications, my sense is that Muradja is a kind of ideal type of a certain kind of intersectional Armenian from the early modern period. Half French and half Catholic, Armenian Muradja was fully a cosmopolite and an Ottoman subject. I have stumbled across and studied many such Armenian cultural and diplomatic elites before, and anyone interested in perusing uh, or in pursuing these men of liminality and how frequently their Catholic Armenian sobriety cropped up in the Dragomanate institution in early modern Constantinople, only need to pursue Natalie Rothman's recent excellent book, The Dragoman Renaissance, Diplomatic Interpreters and the Routes of Orientalism. Without wishing to essentialize this type I think several conclusions are possible and even necessary on the question of whether being a Catholic Armenian in the Ottoman Empire may have contributed to the knowledge production on display in the Tableau General. Armenian Catholics like Muranja, but also like Vartam Pasha, were what I have called elsewhere threshold people. They were quintessentially transculturated and in between their liminality opened them to greater channels of information and knowledge than others who were less mobile, less in between, and less likely to be open to embracing difference. Being Catholic and Armenian in the early modern Ottoman Empire, in other words, made one more likely to be a go-between standing at the intersection where being Ottoman, Armenian, Catholic, and French as well as a Swedish nobleman, 
become conceivable and in Ignatia Muradja's case, in part possible. Perhaps it is fitting to conclude my desultory comments about a liminal cosmopolitan figure by revisiting a celebrated definition of cosmopolitanism by the quintessential philosophe himself, Denis Diderot. In his entry under Cosmopolite, published in the 1751 edition of the Encyclopédie, Diderot famously defined the cosmopolitan as, and I quote, a man who is a stranger nowhere in the world. My colleague at UCLA, Margaret Jacob, has written a wonderful study that uses Diderot's definition as its point of departure, it compellingly demonstrating that the early modern period was indeed teeming with such cosmopolitan individuals who, as Diderot suggested, seem to feel at home everywhere in the world. Muraja appears to have personified some of these traits. He was, to some extent, ruthless, multilingual, culturally promiscuous, and protean, that is like the Greek uh, figure, the figure from Greek mythology, Proteus, and he embodied what Stephen Greenblatt in a different context has termed a mobile sensibility, which he identified in a certain type of self-fashioning individual who was capable of empathizing with other cultures and societies. In his life and work, Muranja was exquisitely attuned to Ottoman values and did not shy about displaying his admiration and loyalty to the Ottoman realm that had nurtured and even perpetuated the kind of politics of difference he personified. However, hierarchical and unequal such a perpetuation of Ottoman-sponsored difference may have been. At the same time, and in conclusion, Muraja's life, like that of other intersectional Armenians from the period, invites us to consider the figure of the cosmopolite as the reverse of what Diderot defined, namely, as Mohammed Tabakoli Tarhi once remarked, as a man who is, quote, a stranger everywhere in the world. This feeling of sensibility of experiencing multiple and simultaneous alienations, displacements, and belongings that come with a territory of being intersectional and in between, of lingering, as it were, mostly on the threshold of cultures and societies, of neither being fully Armenian, French, Swedish, or Ottoman, but simultaneously, all of them in fragments, afforded the author of the tableau with diverse and rich bandwidth of information and cultural intimacy. However, as Muranja's life suggests, being a stranger everywhere and being perceived as an alien also came with its costs. Often enough, when faced with state authorities, such individuals became suspect in their lives, the sites of fear and to some extent also loathing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sybil. Thank you so, so much for uh, actually talking on the, um, uh, the WhatsApp. I am again, once again, very, very sorry uh, for the technical troubles. The audience for questions, please, uh, if you have any questions, raise your hands. And in the meantime, while the audience might be coming up with questions and we could also be, we, I would also be happy to entertain questions coming from chat. Uh, I, I'm gonna see whether uh, the uh, panelists have some comments uh, for each other in the first round while the audience is thinking. Claudia, Carter, um, uh, Sebu, I'm gonna keep you there so that I can take you back on the screen, um, please. Oh, Carter, you have to unmute yourself just one second and then we'll hear you. Yes, um, I might just pick up, of course, there are lots of things I could pick up on, but I, let me just pick up on the, on the point Claudia mentioned about the use of the term statistical. Uh, I had a colleague, David Lindenfeld, who book, uh, wrote a book called The Sciences of the State. 
the statistics was originally useful information for purposes of states. And in Heimer's period, it included all kinds of things. Uh, and it only subsequently narrowed down to statistics because so many of this, these kinds of information that were important for purposes of state had a numerical aspect. And uh, particularly when you're talking about things like demographics, you needed advanced mathematical uh, methods to be able to analyze them. So in, in von Hammer's period, statistics would include anything like political geography or kanun or all kinds of other subjects. Uh, and only subsequently did it narrow down to a branch of applied mathematics. Thank you, thank you. Any questions from the floor, from the audience? Any hands, anyone on the chat? Yes. Oh, there's Gunsel. The chat. No, um, I can sell our job. Oh, oh, oh, uh, Duja. Yes, please. Uh, Duja Jerkovic, uh, please go ahead. Karte, Hi. First of all, pronounce your own. Okay. Please. Hmm. Would you like to go right. first? Please go ahead. Let me go first. Okay, shall I? All right. No, I just. No, I can sell our job. Hello. I just uh, wanted to thank you, Carter, for, uh, as an art historian, of course, I must first say that, uh, for bringing up the artistic content of uh, Tableau General and how, how significant it is for us, for, for I mean, so many, uh, I mean, it's significant for not only for content, but also how he was able to really uh, get this material, you know, all these uh, portraits and all these that we've been talking about <clears throat> and, uh, and really create a new genre of painting through these portraits, you know, you put, putting them up in uh, on a family tree, uh, also working with Hilaire in Paris and this and that, but uh, I also want to mention that the dragoman really had so much access to the uh, Ottoman court. Interiors, I mean, I think one of our colleagues were saying that he, he, he would have used other uh, sources for certain details, but dragomen are allowed to go, you know, especially with the ambassadors because they're translators and they see all the interiors of the court and of course, the father-in-law being such a significant person for, you know, uh, for mm -hmm. the court, he really had correct information. And I, as an art historian, I'm thankful really to Dosson for bringing up all this material. And also I can mention this, that through this project, I mean, the illustrations in the book, and uh, really witness uh, a new era in Ottoman painting. It's not only Sultanic portraiture, but also this uh, really cosmopolitan uh, artistic milieu in, in Istanbul. I think that's in the Ottoman capital. This is very significant. I mean, Konstantin is also, you know, Kapudala. We worked uh, so much, uh, I mean, uh, on, on his works and such a significant person, not only taking commissions from the Ottoman court, but I mean, all again in this artistic milieu in Istanbul. And uh, it, it, so uh, really, I know you wanted to bring this up in your book, especially, and I think uh, it, it's an excellent source for all of us. And uh, really, we, we have to read this cosmopolitan uh, our atmosphere and this artistic milieu in the Ottoman capital. And then, you know, we don't have to really go so deep in, in religion and the, you know, nationality in this, but it's this uh, cosmopolitan milieu. Uh, you know, we have, of course, all the, the Europeans who reside there and, you know, all the, this, uh, and I find it uh, this century very, very significant for that, you know. And we tried to bring it up in our publications, Carter, as you know. So, yes. Uh, yes. Any other comments by historians, of course, will be very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. There was a question, there was a hand by Duje Jerkovic. Uh, Duje Jerkovic. 
Oh, uh, Duya Yarkovich. I'm sorry for the mispronunciation. Duya Yarkovich, Yarkovich please. Yeah, right. uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, if I can say a few words of my own, uh, some notes and uh, ideas. Uh, I'm very, I was very interested to listen to this lecture as I am a PhD student of University of Padua and I am researching on uh, 17th century the Venetian and the Ottoman subjects, including intellectual aspects. And I would here notice uh, one detail that seems to me very important, especially to understand the book and to continue with the uh, opinions of G the gentleman who is studying the Armenians uh, issue from WhatsApp. I'm sorry for not uh, being able to remember the name. Um, that is in the subtitle, it is mentioned uh, Lege Moslemano uh, or something like, uh, something like that. Uh, I believe that it's not the law itself. I believe it is, uh, especially as we see in the content, uh, that there is a lot of speaking of Islam that still in the 18th century, the Islam itself was uh, seen as um, Lex Mahometani Pseudo Profete. They continue to see from the medieval times. And basically, we should not look for the law itself, but for the religious code, the description of the Islam itself. That is a ledger of, uh, ledge of the Mohammed. Uh, that is the one thing. And then is, there is a question. If someone from the Ottoman Empire allows his book to be published by, well, subtitle that is from the Catholicism about the Islam, what does it say about his cosmopolitan complex identity? And how much is it enlightening? If we are talking about enlightenment, I mean, enlightenment, the various authors have a various ideas about the Islam, some being sometimes positive, sometimes negative. I think Voltaire is one of the best examples. But I think that this subtitle of the book is something that perhaps complicates the issue a little bit more than it's been presented in this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Carter, would you like to respond? Well, um, I'm not sure uh, exactly. One thing I might mention is that uh, when Dosson got to Paris, he, he also had to work with a the deal with the French censorship system, which um, and uh, Robert Darnton's latest book or the latest one I used um, is about censorship and it has an interesting section on how this system worked in the Ancien Regime. And what's very important to understand, it was both it was both productive and prohibitive. And in fact, uh, the first sign that the prince at the court, the monsieur, was interested in the book was the assignment of a mysterious background figure, the Abbe Parent de Vassy, as Dossin's uh, uh, assistant to help him improve his language. And of course, Dossal knew French as, I mean, he, he'd gone through French schools in Istanbul. He knew French as well as this doctor of theology. He just didn't have a, a doctorate in theology from the Sorbonne, which was a faculty of theology in those days. So the, this, this guy introduces, uh, it's sort of like, it reminds me of, of, of books produced in communist countries in the last phase of Marxism. They will have to have one or two Marxist strike one or two Marxist notes in the beginning, and then they can go on and say whatever else they want to. So Dosan's book has got stuff in it that it, it, isn't, it, it isn't quite right, or in some cases it's even a little bit Islamophobic. And then he goes on and, and talks about our holy prophet, and he quotes in detail from the Multika al Abhur and, and all of this kind of stuff. And I think the title about La Legislation Maometan don't pin too much on interpreting that because it was probably a, a, a, something they did to present it in terms that the the French readership of the 1780s would understand. You got to sort of you know make put your book on the map for people through the title, and so I wouldn't put too much money on interpreting that. And also inside the book, you occasionally find these little notes of skepticism about, about Islam, uh, but, but then he quickly moves on past that. 
so uh, uh, and he demonstrates in depth where he has uh, on, on topics that his manuscripts cover, like his he had the Sher Himef Kufati uh, rather than original manuscript of the Multaka Al Abhur itself. But that that includes all the Arabic passages, which are then explained in Turkish, and then you repeat that over and over again. So he had quite exact information about things that he had sources on. But then when he got to to something that was not covered in the manuscripts he had with him in Paris, he couldn't make quite silly mistakes. One of the good things about studying the book, the text, as well as the illustrations, is that uh, uh, to the extent that art historians have led in taking an interest in Dossal, they try to interpret the engravings without looking at the text. I mean, it's, it's quite a big project to read that whole book and then and then start interpreting the engravings. But the the the the gain from doing that is then you can interpret the engravings more more exactly and more completely. Uh, so I thank uh, both uh, Gunsel Hoja and uh, is this Duya Yerkovic? Am I reading that correctly? I thank both of you for your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I guess uh, uh, Duya's point um, about that, that, that made me think, I mean, Things are relative. Um, obviously, there is going to be some bias about Islam in Europe at this time. Uh, it, let's imagine how it would be a similar book about uh, Europe in the Ottoman Empire and how that would be represented. I think I think it's uh, still pretty, I find it pretty enlightening personally. It, let me see whether there are any other questions coming from the audience here at this moment. Oh, yep, I see a hand. Yasir Yilmaz. Please go ahead, Yasir. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Dr. Findlay. Uh, as I speak, I have a copy of the book uh, sitting on my desk. It's a fascinating work, spectacular research. It's impressive. Um, I have a question about the friendship between uh, Murachan and Ratib Efendi. Yes. Um, now, I uh, read also your article about Ratib Efendi's uh, embassy and his, uh, uh, um, his uh, you know, Büyüklaya, the, the, the, the large uh, uh, narrative, uh, both in the book and in that article. And I know that this is something also Fatih Yeshil uh, mentions uh, in his uh, biographical uh, narrative of uh, Ratib Efendi's uh, uh, life and career. Um, you almost imply that parts of Ratib Efendi's account was probably written by uh, Murat Can. You, you never say this, but as I was reading uh, uh, your uh, article from the 90s, and I also looked for that information in the book, uh, where you mentioned the friendship between the two in Vienna. Um, one gets the impression that Murachan might have played some role in the actual uh, writing process of Ratib Efendi's uh, um, uh, travel account. Uh, well, it, it's not only a travel account, obviously, it's more than a travel account. And I wanted to ask you if uh, you had some other thoughts, some maybe uh, ideas, observations that did not go into writing uh, uh, about their friendship, uh, their exchanges. Uh, this is what I wanted to ask. Thank you very much. Well, uh, the article I, I wrote, I think it came out in the Wiener Zeitschrift in uh, 95 or thereabouts on, on uh, uh, Ratib Efendi's, uh, uh, uh, well, his Nemche uh, Separet Namesi, I guess is what he called it. Uh, the, well, that is an immensely long uh, manuscript. It's something like 500 pages long in the uh, microfilm I had. But Ratib Efendi was only in Vienna for, I don't know, six months or a few months. Uh, in my article, I said exactly 
uh, what it was. So the question is, how could he have collected and organized that much information in such a short time? Dossin was passing through Paris. He had had to leave, I'm sorry, passing through Vienna. He'd had to leave Paris in a hurry in 1791 or two, whichever it was exactly. He got to Vienna by 1792, desperate to start over and having lost all his money and not knowing whether the rest of his book would ever get published. <clears throat> and uh, and so it just was a piece of luck for him that Rata Befendi was there and uh, and they found each other. And the, the, the evidence I later found about how uh, Rata Befendi tried to support Moraja back in Istanbul and help him get that subsidy payment in uh, 1796 or whenever it was, uh, that that simply adds more to this picture. I don't have any proof of this, and I'm not saying Dosa wrote it for him. But the taxonomic methodology, the ta the the the tax the Linnaean taxonomic methodology that Abu Bakr Rateb Effendi uses is exactly what Muraja had been using in Paris before. And of course, Muraja would have learned about it through his connections with the Swedes, presumably. And so you can't prove that Raja did any of this. And of course, uh, uh, Rata Befendi might have found other people in, in um, Austria who could help him. But uh, uh, doesn't he have exact information about the uh, Theresianische Militärakademie, Academy, for, for example? Well, Dosso enrolled his son Constantine in that school. So, of course, while he was in Paris. So, of course, Dosso would have had access to the things like the uh, um, uh, curriculum and the, and the house regulations of the school. And that kind of stuff gets shows up in Rata Befendi's Sefaret Name. So, so this this indirect evidence, it's circumstantial evidence, but Rata Befendi would have needed help from somebody to produce a manuscript of that size on the basis of an embassy that only lasted a few months, while he was supposedly, you know, meeting with the Kaiser and the and the Chancellor and I don't know who all else and doing official business. Uh, that that's what led me to that conclusion. And and after they both got back to Istanbul, nobody in the Ottoman elites tried harder to to cooperate with Moraja and please Moraja than Rata Befendi. And in fact, it cost him his it led to his fall from the from this uh, reset. Thank you. So that, that, that's the evidence for that. Thank you, Carter. Thank you so, so much. Let me see whether there are any other questions on chat or any raised hands among the audience. Um, I don't see anyone. Then I act. Oh, I, Daniel, Daniel, please go ahead, Daniel. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the talks uh, and the reflections. Uh, in the spirit of um, the, uh, the last reflection, thinking about what comes after the book. I have just a small question. It was my it's my understanding that uh, there is a um, uh, Dosson archive in Lund. And so I was just wanting to know, um, given everything that was said, do we know whether it includes information in Armenian that he might have explained with the um, Venetians? Um, what are the, what's the likelihood that we'd find the kind of information we're looking for there? Uh, yes, Se Sebu, uh, rest right here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yes. Sebu Hoja. Oh, it's the question is for me? I, I, I thought so. Daniel, did you I, mean I, it for Sebu? Because you were asking about the archive in uh, Venice, I think. Am I right? Am, did I get that right? I'm asking about the archive in Lund. I imagine either Professor oh. Stanley or Professor Finley might know something archive about it. Archive where? I can't catch where. In Lund, isn't that right? Professor Stanley and I thought that's that's what I understood. Perhaps I misunderstood. That's why I understand it well. The Lund archives. But I'm not an expert on the topic, so I would defer to... Uh, uh, I'm still, I'm still not getting the 
if there was a place name there that identified the archive, I'm still not getting it. Are we talking about a particular archive? The Lund, Lund archive. Uh, Lund in Sweden. Uh, oh, Lund. Oh, the, yes, the, uh, my, my bibliography in, includes references to the sources I found in Sweden. There's correspondence files at Uppsala uh, that mostly had to do with Per Olaf von, uh, von Asp, who was uh, also a, a Swedish minister uh, in the 1790s. But there's a lot about Dosa in that collection. And then Lund is the library that actually, to which Dosa actually gave Maraja's books. So the engraving, the, my ability to identify that engraving that, that he calls the Forma de Livre Turc, my ability to identify that as picture of Dosa's actual books was because I had seen those manuscripts and photographed them in the Lund University Library. Lund also has some other papers. Uh, so these are, uh, these are not archives, but they're, the collect they're sort of like the university libraries with their collections of manuscripts and, and correspondence. Uh, there was also some correspondence in the Royal Library in Istanbul. And, and the Swedes have been amazingly thorough with this stuff. So in the Royal Library in, in, in, in Stockholm, you can find letters indexed by who wrote it, who it was addressed to, and anybody who is mentioned in the letter. I mean, I, I don't know if Lund and Uppsala have indexed things that thoroughly, but the Puglia Bibliotheca in Stockholm has. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, uh, it, since there is no question that I see, there was something I wanted to mention as I was inspired by um, the, the Sebuk's presentation. It, it, it, it, I wanted to share a piece that is new to me. Uh, for those of you who are uh, better informed, would not be new. Oh, oh, wait a minute. I see, I see a hand. When I see audience, I give preference to audience. Rupan Barbarian. Uh, Mr. Barbarian, please go ahead. I don't have a question, sorry. Oh, I saw your hand raised, that's why. All right, I'm sorry. That was perhaps a mistake. I'm very, very sorry. All right, so what I was trying to say was, uh, I was teaching um, modern Turkish literature, even though I know almost nothing about it, it, simply because a comparative literature graduate student asked me to um, you know, come up with uh, some readings for her. And uh, Sebu mentioned uh, the Vartan Pasha's uh, novel uh, in Armena Turkish. Apparently, uh, the first uh, plays, uh, theater plays, drama plays, a sort of modern drama, rather than uh, the Orta Oyunu of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, but the, rather the tradition of the modern drama, which we usually start with Shinasi in the 19th century in Turkey, uh, actually started also at the uh, San Lazaro uh, uh, in Venice. Uh, there were uh, Mihitarist uh, uh, priests who did drama in Armenian as well as Armeno Turkish. And the, uh, these plays uh, from uh, earlier in the 19th century have been published uh, in Istanbul now uh, by Yervant Baret Manok. Uh, and the title is Doğu ile Batı Arasında San Lazaro Sahnesi, Ermeni Mahitaris Manastırı ve İlk Türkçe Tiyatro Oyunları. Uh, in 2013, I believe, I'm hoping that I'm right to assume this, Murat Cankara is doing some work on this. Uh, and hopefully uh, we might read some more about it in English. Uh, so the, uh, th that is another example of the significance that uh, uh, Catholic Armenians played in uh, history. And, and in that context, I had a question for Sebu. Uh, this is just out of curiosity and not related to Muraja uh, from Vartan Pasha, having read Vartan Pasha's Akabi Hikayesi with the student, I'm curious, the, the, the tensions that he sort of narrates uh, and fictionalizes in Istanbul between Catholic and uh, Orthodox Armenians, is there anything like that in Europe, in European uh, Armenian communities, or is that something more peculiar to uh, Ottoman uh, Ar Armenian Cebu? Any, any idea? Would, is that something you would know anything about? 
So uh, could you repeat uh, one more time? Was oh, question about oh I, I, I was Father? just asking, I, I was asking, I read this Akabi uh, Kiyasi with a graduate student recently, and in it, the author uh, sort of fictionalizes a story uh, that reflects tensions between Catholic and uh, sure. um, Orthodox so. Armenians. Yeah. And I was curious whether uh, that is something peculiar to the Ottoman context, or does one come across to that in Europe as well? In which case, I'm wondering whether that might be one of the reasons why there is less uh, muraja in Armenian sources. Well, I don't know about the last segment of your question, but I can I can take a stab at the question about whether that's something specific to uh, the Ottoman milieu or not. And I can say um, that I think there is something to be said for specificity of the milieu and the timing in the 19th century, in the middle of the 19th century. As you know, Akabi Kiyasi was published in 1851 and at a time when there was significant um, interconfessional strife as late as the 19th century between in, in Istanbul and in other places in the Ottoman Empire between the Catholic Armenians and Apostolic uh, or Orthodox Armenians. So I think if there is something specific to it, it's the milieu of the and the timing of the 19th century context of Bartam Pasha's work because such things are actually going on around him that were reflected in his, in his novel. I don't know if that answers your question. I'm not a specialist on, um, on the novel itself, but um, that's the best I can give you. Is Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I, have, I have a question if I may for, uh, please. Uh, for, for Carter. Uh, my question, uh, Carter, is um, you've, you've also served as the uh, president, I think, of the World History Association at some point in your past. And your work resonates with world world historical um, issues and methodology. So I'm thinking particularly your book on the Turks in world history. So my question is whether you, my question is how you how you personally contextualize your most recent work on Murad Jha in the context of the rising scholarship in world history, or and specifically uh, whether you uh, whether you think there's something useful in the con in the discussions that have been going on among world historians for the last 10, 20 years on the question of go-betweens in world history. So the literature on go-betweens I noticed was not uh, is not something that you seem to be keen on. And I was just wondering why that is the case. Maybe that's well, not the case. Uh, uh, stop for a while. Uh, uh, the, the, unfortunately, the answer to your question is, is it has a very long tail that leads off in two different directions. Um, my interest in go between started as a graduate student. There were two people I was curious about, two books I had to rely on. And I was curious about how the authors learned enough to write the books and whether they were really as authoritative as they seemed. One of them was Red House, who uh, uh, mastered Turkish at a time when there was no organized way to learn uh, Turkish, to study Turkish in his native country of England. The other was this Dosan character with this funny made up looking name who wrote this book that he called a history, but, but the only reason it was useful to me because it was not a history as I knew it, but more like a public administration or political science manual. As Anne-Marie Schimmel said when she heard about this, oh, Wissenschaftsgeschichte, you've got two topics in Wissenschaftsgeschichte, the history of the field. Well, Red House produced one article and those songs kept me busy for the rest of my life. In the meantime, I had gotten interested in world history as a teaching field because just at the time when I got tenure, uh, they announced they were going to might have to have a retrenchment program that would include tenured faculty. And of course, who would be the first to go but the last one to get tenure? And uh, so my department wanted, for completely bad reasons, to introduce a team talk coast about the world in the 20th century. And I had always liked big picture things as well as micro empirical ones. So I immediately rushed forward and, and volunteered to be the non-Westernist to develop that field. That is my beginning in world history. And I am the 
co-author and in fact surviving author of a book called 20th Century World of which the seventh revised edition came out in 2010. That's when I got I started, that's the connection in which I started to get active in the World History Association. So uh, I am very much interested in the go-betweens and uh, in my Turks in world history, for example, uh, the the example, uh, the, the little scene I wrote about the about how much Rashid Nadine learned from this uh, wandering Mongol that uh, um, that um, what's his name, the guy who's the expert on Olson, uh, uh brought to light. Uh, that's just one more piece of it. And and Red House is a perfect example of these people who are go betweens and they use this sort of gift that they bring from afar as a way to launch themselves in this new environment where they want to succeed. Uh, Dosan uh, doesn't have any Armenian descendants, but he does have descendants in two aristocratic lineages in Sweden. So that's the kind of success Dosan was interested in. <laughs> what he want, I mean, that's what he wanted to do for his family. Okay, so I, you're, Thank you. you asked two questions in one, and I gave you two answers. Thank you, Carter. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? If there aren't any, and I are already, we are actually about uh, being beyond our one hour and a half. We are now on 1036. Uh, but Carter, you wanted to ask something, I think. Go ahead. Well, one last thing I'd like to call to everybody's attention. Uh, over the years, uh, I, I collected evidence where I could find it about the reception of Dosson's work. It turns out to be a very long and thin tale that shows up in all kinds of unexpected places. But what surprised me the most was that the first person to notice Dosson's work was Abdurrahman al-Jabarti in Egypt in the 1790s. And the reason he saw it was that after the Napoleonic invasion of Egypt, Napoleon brought this group of scholars down there as his Institut de l'Egypte, and they had their library, and they invited local uh, uh, uh, ulama like uh, Al Jabarti, local scholars, to come tour their library. And uh, Jabarti wrote a book called the Mudata, Mudata Francis Bimusser. And in that book, he describes the book they showed him in their library. Of course, he could not read French, but he could see the illustrations. And so he describes the illustrations in terms that make it completely explicit and clear that what he saw was both the first and second folio volumes of Dosso's tableau, which they had, which were the only ones that had come out at that point. And he comments on on the on, on how, what they show. He says, for example, that they depicted the Prophet Muhammad according according to their understanding, and that frontispiece illustration is the only one that's inauthentic because it was done as a counterblast against. Schwazel's from his piece. And then he describes others which he does think are authentic. He just misrepresents it because he says that they show the mirage going up from above the Kaaba rather than the the the rather than the rock, or or or maybe he's got it the other way around. But anyway, there were two different traditions about where the prophet, where the mira, mira, the prophet's mirage went up from, whether it's from the Kaaba or from the dome in Jerusalem, and uh, he misremembered the one that's actually shown in Dosal's engraving. Uh, and you can tell he saw the second volume because he also uh, talks describes the picture map of the pilgrimage to Mecca uh, on the first day of Korban by Ram, and so you know he saw both both of the volumes that then existed. So that is the first person to notice Dosal's book and mentioned it in writing, and it occurred in Egypt sometime after 1798. That is extremely interesting, actually. An Ottoman subject's work on the Ottoman Empire in, enters Ottoman Empire through the French invasion of Egypt. That is, that is so, so interesting. Yeah, I thought it was wonderful. And nobody had ever noticed this. A lot of people have read that book. But if you know Dosan's engravings the way I do, 
it just leaps out to you. You can tell right away which ones he's talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, Cebu, one more time, I am extremely sorry about the technical difficulties that we had today. Thank you so much for all of you joining us. Thank you, Carter, for sharing uh, your work with us. Thank you, Claudia, for your comments. Thank you, Cebu, for your comments. Thank you for uh, everyone. Um, have a wonderful day, and uh, hopefully we'll see you at another What's Up meeting. Next month, uh, we'll be talking about Mark Baer's recent book uh, on the a trade title on the Ottomans. Uh, if uh, You will be receiving a notice about that in your email. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Bucky. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.